The largest flying birds alive today, being the wandering albatross, several species of large pelicans, and the Andean condor, are truly impressive birds in the air, having wingspans of 3 meters plus, capping out at about 3.7 meters. Indeed, being very amazing to see, it's fascinating to think that in the past, there were even bigger birds capable of flies, one of which being the ever-interesting Argentavis. Living around 7 million years ago in the central and northwestern regions of Argentina, they lived during the Miocene Epoch, and as mentioned, were far and away one of the largest birds and animals in general ever to fly. To gain some additional evolutionary background on them and their origins, they belong to the extinct bird family of Teratornithidae, the monster birds as they were named for their impressive size, with the group actually being best known from North America. Only dying out about 11,000 years ago, this makes them quite the long-lasting and also recent group of birds, and a group that has had many misconceptions about their appearance and behaviours over the years. It has been found that they group most closely to the New World vultures, the family Cathartidae, which either belong to their own order of Cathartiformes or the order Axopitriformes, which includes all living birds of prey, excluding the falcons and owls. Given their close relation to New World vultures, therefore, it's fitting then that for a long time the birds were reconstructed to have a similar appearance to them and to other vultures, which also track to their behaviours as well. In paleoart, especially in older pieces, they are almost always depicted as large vulture-like birds with clear condor and vulture coloration and integument, which is interesting as when looking at their bones more closely, this is actually pretty far from the case. On first glance, they do indeed seem to be ideal scavengers, given that flight studies have found that they were exceptional soarers. More on that will be covered later on in the video when I get more into Argentavis, as well as the fact that they have hooked up a beak that would have been ideal to hook into and get into carcasses. Studies since the 1980s have found, however, that teratons like Argentavis were actually poorly suited to a primarily scavenging lifestyle, but were instead much more active predators. To begin, more complete teratons like Teratornis have quite a different general skull structure compared to known scavenging birds like vultures. Dietary preference has a strong influence on the skull shapes of predatory birds, and so is very relevant in determining their lifestyles and behaviours. Vultures have narrow, largely inflexible and low skulls, alongside a strong hooked end to their beaks, which makes them especially good at latching onto chunks of meat and then being able to pull back to feed on it with little strain on their skulls. This weakness to all but vertical forces reflects clearly on the immobile nature of the carcasses vultures feed on, and this is something not seen in teratons. These birds on the other hand have been found to have highly flexible and broad skulls with a deep dorsoventral rostrum, that while indeed possessing a well-developed hook at the end of their beak, its size and association with a robust jaw better matches what is seen in eagles and other raptors, where the beak functions more as an aid to grabbing than as a meat hook. While scavenging is certainly not out of the picture for them occasionally, this more loose and bulky skull configuration is certainly not at all typical for a primarily scavenging birds, and instead suits a lot more with other different species of birds. A better match for them instead is animals like eagles, and interestingly enough, albatross. These latter birds have a low slung palate, just like teratons, which fits neatly between the lower jaw when the mouth is closed. Set configuration has the function of being able to grab prey by pinching it between the palates and the inner margin of the mandible, without there being any gaps for the prey to struggle out of easily, which is also seen in teratons. This doesn't necessarily indicate that teratons, like Argentavis, were predominant fish eaters, however, as this adaptation can also be used just as effectively for small terrestrial prey as well. Not to mention that the bone chemistry indicates the main diets of terrestrial animals regardless, apparently being quite diverse as has been found. Overall, these skull features also show that with their jaws being more loosely jointed and able to expand their gape an additional 10% when opening their mouths, they were even better equipped to swallowing prey whole instead of tearing it apart. Their feet are also interesting in that they lack the long and powerful talons characteristic to many other birds of prey. That shows that they didn't necessarily use them to capture and restrain prey, with their pelves also differing as well, so the musculature involved in said movements was also quite different. Eagles and similarly adapted birds like falcons have strongly bent posterior pelvic regions which optimise the position of their leg musculature to better move rapidly when the legs need to be moved. Teratornithids on the other hand have quite straight pelves that appear a lot more similar to storks and birds that do most of their hunting on foot, meaning that they were better adapted for walking and striding around, which is quite a bit different from their raptorial relatives. A best animal to compare animals like Argentavis and other teratons, therefore, would be birds like the Caracara, which occupy a very similar kind of niche as to what's suggested for these extinct birds. 
These stronger legs, as well as helping for quick boosts of speeds and long strides, are also helpful in making quick landings after prey has been spotted in the air, also allowing for quick launches off of the grounds to avoid any danger. Regarding their capacity for eating animals whole, it has been estimated that in the case of Argentavis, with a huge, estimated skull length of about 55cm, could have swallowed whole animals up to 15cm wise, meaning hair-sized animals like armadillos, the very small South American notoungulates that were common of the time, as well as sloths, would have been easily obtained prey for them. Getting more to Argentavis specifically, they for the longest time since their discovery were thought to be the largest flying birds ever known to exist, with some wingspan estimates of 7 to even 8 metres being known of, though, as will be got into, is not all that likely at all. From close examination of the much more completely known Teratoris merimai, a fairly close relative that is known from almost 100 individuals from the La Brea Tarpes, many of which are nearly complete, they allow into a better look into the overall proportions that Argentavis has. While not having complete wings, we do have a part of their humerus, which has been estimated at about 57cm in length when comparing them with other pterotorns, with some researchers regressing a surprisingly small wing spread of just 3.6m, which is way under what would be expected. Today, a wingspan of around 5 to 5.7 meters, with a general upper limit of 6 meters, is most agreed upon, as to reach 7 to 8 meter wingspans would both require very unusual wing proportions that will not allow them to fly in the first place, as well as extraordinarily long flight feathers. To attain such sizes, Argentavis will need primary feathers, the feathers used for thrust and lift, to reach unprecedented lengths of 1.5 to 2 meters, which wouldn't make sense given what we know of how these feathers correlate with size. Primary feathers actually correlate negatively to wingspan, with larger birds like albatross and other similar sized birds actually having proportionally small flight feathers. A prime example of allometry, how animals given proportions change with size. To get to wingspans of 7 to 8 meters, Argentavis weird wing feathers reaching insane lengths of 1.5 to 2 meters in length, longer than a person, the proportions of which are not known of in any birds, comparable or not. This wingspan puts them out of the running for the largest flying birds, at least for total wingspan. Their weight is another story, with the seagoing pelagornithids consistently known to have wingspans of 6 to 7 meters, which were perfect for soaring across the open ocean. However, in spite of their larger wingspans, these birds only had masses of about 16 through 40 kilograms at the very largest, whereas Argentavis was sure to be much heavier. These birds at the low end are estimated to have weighed anywhere from 40 to 70 kilograms just as much as a person, and even as much as some dromaeosaurs. At heights of about 1.5 to 1.8 metres too, they were just as tall as many people as well, and with skulls of half a metre long, look like bobbleheads compared to even other large birds of prey, like the also extinct Haas eagle, with Argentavis looking more like a terror bird than anything else, and unlike them, could actually fly. With that, going back to their wings, how they operated in flight, and if they could even fly at all, has been quite the discussion, and there is a good amount to go over. To begin, it's worth clearing up the argument of a bird's given body mass being correlated with how much wingspan they'd actually need to stay aloft, as estimating body mass from bones alone has a lot of uncertainty and fluctuation, requiring guesses on aspect ratios and also into more specific morphology and lifestyle that may not necessarily be picked up on or considered. It has been noticed that Argentavis had hollow bones, with their wing bones also being quite robust and long, as well as having prominent marks on them that evidently shows that they did possess large flight feathers, which is not seen of in other such birds of similar stature. Whether Argentavis was a flapper or a glider is an interesting point of discussion, as the former case, while being more versatile than gliding, does indeed require a greater supply of power from their flight muscles. Flight muscles themselves are around 17% of a bird's body mass, irrespective of the size of the birds, with the pectoralis muscle representing about 90% of their total flight muscle. For an Argentavis at, say, about 70 kilograms, the pectoralis muscle would be about 11 kilograms, which for them would not allow for continual flapping given their size. The sternum of their close relative, Teratonus miriami, is however twice as wide as that of the California condor, while at the same time being the same length, giving them a mass 200% bigger than those living birds. To better analyse their flight performance alongside their takeoff and landing styles, a computer algorithm, ANFL TPWR Animal Flight Power and ANF LTSIM Animal Flight Simulation were created using several flight parameters and calculations. What was found was that since these two curves that were generated from these simulations did not coincide, Argentavis, like many other large land birds, would have been too large to sustain powered flight. The estimated mechanical power available to them was 170 watts, whereas the minimum needed for sustained flights was 600 watts 
meaning that they needed 3.5 times the estimated power available. This doesn't mean they were incapable of flying though, as instead, like modern vultures and condors, Argentavis would have been soaring birds, in which they maintain a shallow glide and take advantage of rising air to stay afloat without having to expend energy. There are two types of soaring, being thermal soaring, used by the previously mentioned condors and vultures, which involves the use of updrafts to ascend and then glide horizontally, and dynamic soaring, which is used by albatrosses, which instead involves the use of wind speed differences with heights above the sea surface. Studies have suggested that the thermal soaring model is the most likely for Argentavis, with their soaring performance and required wind conditions of the species being comparable to living soaring species based on glide polars and their circling envelopes. This result is indeed consistent with where their remains are known from, as they are known from foothills and known pampas regions which are far from any coastline. If the mountains of the Andes during the Miocene when they lived were similar to today, then the wind circulation patterns were likely not all that different. Argentina, where Argentavis lived however, was much more arid and warm when they were alive, as has been seen by extensive evaporate sequences. This combined with intense solar radiation would have been ideal for creating large thermals in the open cliff and pampas, which would have been especially helpful for these birds. Because of their location, it is likely that Argentavis used two kinds of soaring to manoeuvre around their environment. The first is slope soaring, in where birds fly in a region of rising air caused by the upward deflection of wind over a ridge or cliff. If the sinking speed of the animal is less than the velocity of the rising air, the bird is then able to remain airborne indefinitely without flapping their wings. On the other hand, thermal soaring, as mentioned earlier, does not depend on wind, but instead on convection currents created by solar radiation that heats the ground to well above air temperature. The heated air close to the ground then rises in columns, which can either be continuous or be in a series of discrete bubbles that requires additional navigation. Using these, Argentavis would have been able to glide from thermal to thermal over many kilometres at a time to either their roosting sites or preferred feeding areas. It has been found that Argentavis would have been able to use these methods most effectively, as while being much larger than many of the birds that employ the same strategy, they would have only sunk one metre per second while gliding, which is quite comparable to some living birds like the black vultures, so seeing an Argentavis circling an air column like vultures today would not have been all that uncommon of a size back in Miocene South America. With an estimated mean cruising speed of about 67 km per hour, and a very efficient gliding angle close to 3 degrees, they would have had very great gliding efficiency in the air. However, how they took off from the ground has been more of a puzzle due to their great size. Taking off from the ground alone would be a challenge given the heavy weights as well as that their wings would flap down twice the heights, making continual contact with the ground as they tried to do so. Their presence in lowland areas from their fossil remains however shows that they could survive down in these environments and that, instead of intensively flapping, could have caught the strong gusts of winds present in their pampas environments to take off that way, as can be seen with living albatross that use a similar strategy. In more mountainous areas though, it would be more common for them to employ two different methods. The first would involve them leaping from a tall perch, in where they would need to drop around 20 metres ideally to build up enough speeds to then level out in the air. The second method involves the birds running down a slope and then launching into the air like a hang glider. Whatever the case, Argentavis were truly impressive birds, and one certainly worth covering alongside their close relatives. While unfortunately going extinct, likely down to the rapidly changing climatic conditions of the time, their astounding size and biology is very interesting, and hopefully more remains of them are found in the future, so that we can get a better and more complete understanding of them. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals, and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.